Mark chapter four is where I want you to turn for a few moments. My name's Rich. I come from Miami. It's been a fun week. My, my grandmother, I, I, I come from a long line uh, of preachers. Assemblies of God is, is in our roots. My mom went to Evangel University. My, my grandmother right now, she's actually uh, at Maranatha. She, she is uh, living there. I went and visited her yesterday. She's so fun. I was like, Grandma, I'm preaching tomorrow at James River. You know, I made it. And... Um, <laughs> I was like, you know, can you come? She's like, I got a pretty busy schedule. I'm actually playing piano in the chapel tomorrow. I was like, Grandma, hold on, you're not gonna come? She's like, no, I got a really busy day. I'm like, oh my goodness, she's more busy than I am. And so um, maybe she'll watch this on playback. But uh, this place and what this house means to us is, is, is so important. And uh, today, as we go to God's word, I just wanted to read two little verses out of Mark chapter four. I think that you sit under uh, one of the, the, the best teachers of God's word, uh, the expository, exegetical teaching of Pastor John Lindell. You know, we're just a five-year church plant, which means that we can barely even walk right now. Uh, but after the year that we just had, I came in January to our church and just said, you know, I don't think anybody's looking for something catchy. I think people are looking for something concrete. And then a shaky world, I think we've got something that we can stand on. How many know this is God's word? It, is, it has been through some pandemics. Come on. It has been through some wars. It has been through some political division. And it has stood the test of time. And so we committed as a church to study the gospel of Mark for six months. And so I've just been preaching out of Mark. And just want to draw your attention to Mark chapter 4, verse 30. I'm just going to read two verses and use it as a foundation of what I want to talk to you about. This is Jesus. This is a parable that he's teaching. He says, again, he said, verse Verse 30, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest seed you plant in the ground. Yet when planted, yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants with such big branches that the birds of the air can perch in its shade. It becomes, I like that word becomes. Who you're becoming is more important than who you are today. And maybe you don't like who you are today. That's good news. You're in God's house. And what we believe is, is that right now where you stand does not mean where you have to end, that you can grow and you can become something more in God. I want to take a few moments today. And if you're taking notes, I sure hope you're taking notes. Research shows us that 98% of people who take notes make it to heaven. And so... Um, <laughs> Just, um, just it's, it's, it's there and oh, back up. And so um, I, I want to talk from this subject, small faith, small faith. Now I'm a holler back kind of preacher, um, my, uh, Pentecostal roots, okay? So like this is your day. You could say amen. You could say I like that. You could say preach it, white boy. I don't care, but you have to, you have to verbally engage. Try one of those on the count of three. Ready? One, two, three. All right. I see you. I see you. Uh, small faith. I, I, I like this idea because, uh, once again, uh, the way that I grew up, I, I love my heritage. Uh, honestly, on both sides of, of my family, on my mom's side, my dad's side, four generations, uh, mostly of Assemblies of God preachers. I mean, I grew up in church. My first slow dance was to Our God is an Awesome God. <laughs> you can't make this kind of stuff up, bro. And the chorus is actually kind of nice, right? Our God is an awesome God, he reigns. Like, I like, I could still dance to that. It's the verses that are strange. And the Lord wasn't joking when he kicked him out of Eden. Our God isn't, it's like the wrath of God, you know? <laughs> I don't want to sing about that. But uh, I, I grew up, I, I love the way that I grew up. I mean, I grew up around signs and wonders. And, and I grew up at, you know, long altar moments. We, we grew up on Sunday night church and we grew up watching people filled uh, with the spirit, with the evidence of speaking in tongues. I'm so thankful for how I grew up. I remember one time I was a little boy going to church and watching a preacher. He had called people forward. And as he was, you know, praying for people, people were falling down. I was like, this is crazy. I remember one time my dad said, Rich, if a guy ever tries to push you down, you just grab him by the tie and pull him on down with you. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember as a little boy, I was like going, Dad, I was like, I was like, man, this is crazy. These guys are falling down. I said, I said, I said, Dad, I said, what happens if the preacher prays for himself? He said, what you mean? I said, well, who's going to catch him? <laughs> I thought he would fall down if he prayed for himself. I loved watching God move. I still do. I believe in all of the Bible. I do not believe the gifts have ceased. I believe that our God is the same God yesterday, today, and forever. I believe if he was a healer back then, come on, somebody, he's a healer now. 
I believe all the crazy stuff about the Bible. I just want to be clear because I want to make sure that you understand where I'm coming from. I believe all of it. I remember one time this young guy in our church, I love new Christians because new Christians believe this stuff. Don't you love new Christians? They come to church early, they're like stretching, like, what are you doing? I'm getting ready for worship. You're like, wow, okay. <laughs> Serving at all times. This young guy, he comes to me, he says, Pastor Rich, could you pray for me? I said, what's going on? He said, would you pray for my shadow? I said, pray for your shadow, what's up? He's like, well, I was reading in the New Testament and the scripture told me that as the disciples walked by, that their shadows, whoever it fell on, they were healed. I said, I'm not gonna pray for you, you should pray for me. Because whatever you got, I want that type of faith. I want to believe that even my shadow, come on, even my shadow has the power to watch demons flee. Come on, somebody, give God a shout of praise. You got the same power that conquered death, hell, and the grave. It lives inside of you today. I believe the whole Bible. Yet oftentimes in my heritage and where I grew up, what I've learned is that many times it seems like there's only one set of words attached to this word faith. And the words, many of you know them, they're words like suddenly, and words like immediate, and words like epic. I like those words. There's no doubt that God represents all of those words. But many times, if you only have one set of words to describe something, it can leave you disappointed and depleted. The truth of the matter is, is that when it comes to God, you must learn, I'm trying to teach my church this all the time, God is slow, fast. Thank you, sir. Um, <laughs> meet you at Chili's. Um, he's slow, fast. Like anyone in here who's been following Jesus for a long time, and I know we've got some seasoned saints in the house today, you would be able to testify that God is slow, fast. I just want anyone who's new to the faith, you're, you walked in here, maybe you just went to the men's conference, maybe you just made a new commitment, maybe you're really trying this Jesus thing, please understand that following Jesus is slow. I mean, it's really slow. It's like, I'm still following Jesus. Another worship song, another conference. It's slow, 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 slow. But then all of a sudden it's fast. It's slow, and then it's fast. Then it's slow, then it's immediate, then it's slow. Then it's suddenly, and it's slow, and then fast. It's how God works. It's, it's really, really slow. Here's what I've discovered about God, is that so often all of the suddenly moments, all of the immediate moments, that God, he so often suddenly moves in people's lives who patiently pursue him. That when you recognize that God, he doesn't always work overnight. He does sometimes, but he's always working over time. And if you can learn that your small faith is meaningful, if you can learn that your small faith, that you still serve a big God, that he can do incredible things because it's never been about the size of your faith. Come on, somebody. It has always been about the size of your God. Anybody believe in a big God out there? Anybody believe in a God who can still turn things around? I want you to know today that God can do something big with something very, very small. I, I'm not here to talk to you today about great faith. I just want to talk for a few moments around small faith. I actually think it's a word from the Lord for this house right now in this season because what we're up against, even in this house right now, as our senior pastor has been diagnosed with this, this report, I, I want you to know that God can work in and through our small faith. That cancer is no match for our Savior. Amen that cancer cannot stand up against a risen, alive, active God. And so faith, I, I, I'm always trying to, you know, our church is new. Our church is five years old. It's full of 20-somethings. You guys are all invited. Anytime you want to come, sleep on my couch, you'll enjoy it. It's great. And um, it's, it's all these, like, young people. And I'm always trying to teach, like, our church about this idea of faith because what I've learned is that there's an entire generation right now that has what I call faith in faith. M meaning uh, their faith is not attached to anything. Like I'll meet people in our church, it's like, bro, I love the vibe here at Vu. <laughs> what, 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 what do you love about Vu? I, I love the vibe, man. I don't know what that, word, that voice is, but that's what it sounds like to me. We have this phrase at our church, and I'm sure you do too, it's because it says the best is yet to come. You know, it's like all over the walls. We believe it, we confess it, we declare it. And people are like, bro, I just, I don't know, man. I just think the best is yet to come. And that's like my life motto. I just had it tattooed on my back. I believe that, man. <laughs> Speak faith, talk faith, think faith. That's me, man. I'm a faith guy. Yeah, I just want to be clear. Because faith is not a vibe. 
faith is not a feeling. Faith is more than optimism. It's not faith in faith. What is your faith in? Because you can declare the best is yet to come all you want, and I do believe the best is yet to come, unless you're not in God's will. It's pretty encouraging this morning, hey? (laughs) No, the best is yet to come can only be stated and declared if you are in Christ Jesus. Because when I say that phrase, I am not just talking about a happily ever after. No, I'm talking about something far greater, that no matter what comes to me in this life, pain, suffering, disease, sickness, and death, I'm not living for happily ever after. Is there anybody in this house who would declare with me, I am living for a heaven ever after. I am believing that I am moving forward from glory to glory and strength to strength, and if I'm in Christ Jesus, the best is always yet to come. It is not about the strength of your faith, it's about the object of your faith. What is your faith attached to? Because you could put up a chair up here with three legs on it, and I don't care how much faith you have for that chair. You could do a Jericho march, you could shout, you could go to my dad's office, get his shafar, blow it, the chair still won't hold you up. The same way you could jump into a pool with a life preserver, and you could say, I have faith in a life preserver. But how many of you know it doesn't matter how much faith you have in the life preserver, the point is that the life preserver is strong enough, that object is strong enough to hold you up. What is your faith attached to? A few weeks ago, um, <laughs> my, my, my brother-in-law, you would love my brother-in-law, he lives in my house, which is odd, and um, it's my wife's brother, it's, oh my God. Okay, so anyways, family drama, I'm in therapy, not a big deal. Anyways, and so um, <laughs> he comes home and he's like, he's like, bro, I got you a TV, 70 inch TV. Now listen. People say bigger is always better. That's not always true. But when we're talking about TVs, it's always true, okay? All the men, I like this guy. Jeans are tight, but I like this guy. I'm coming for you, man. Just take a little time to warm up. It's a big day. I don't always get checks presented to me right before I preach. And so I had, to get this, I had to get this TV mounted, because you could imagine, I don't, I, I don't know how to build anything. I, I pray for things, you know, that's what I do. And so I got this handyman, he's the best handyman in Miami, he comes in, he's got a tool belt. It's like, this is a guy, you know, people know his name at Home Depot, not a big deal. And so he comes in and, and, he, and he hangs the TV up. And I, I'm a detail guy, you know, I wanted the right type of stand. I don't like any of the cables showing. It looked perfect. I came home, I was like, wow, look at that. I went in my office, like, look at this big old TV, it's great. And I'm just, I'm, this is true. I walk over to it, I don't do much. I just look at it, I just, you know, I just, I just subtly tilt it. I just barely touch it. <laughs> I sit down. Five seconds later, this entire TV falls. <laughs> falls off the wall and shatters on the floor. Have you ever had something happen so suddenly that your knee-jerk response was to repent? I started confessing every sin I could think of. I'm like, do I have hidden sin? Am I like aching? What is going on? Is it sins of omission, God? I don't know. I was speaking in tongues right then and there. It scared me. I called this guy. I'm like, bro, what, you just hung, what just happened? He looked at me and said, he said, what did you do? I said, I didn't do nothing, bro. I barely even touched it, and it fell off the wall. He comes back to the house, and he finds out that my office, whoever built it, it wasn't up to code, and that the sheetrock was sitting three inches off of every one of the studs. And so when he drilled the screws into the wall, they looked good. The TV was there, but it wasn't attached to anything. In just one little touch, just a simple touch, that thing came crashing down. I don't know who you are today. I don't know what you walked in here with. I don't know what your bank account says. I don't know what you're projecting in life. You might look like you have it all together. But if your life is not attached to Jesus, it is just a matter of time before this world touches you. And when this world touches you, you're gonna find yourself collapsing. You're gonna find yourself crashing and burning. Oh, but can I preach to the saints in the house today? If you are in this room, you could be facing hell and high water 
But if you have drilled your faith into the person of Jesus, it doesn't have to be pretty, it doesn't have to look nice, but if you have attached yourself to him, I got good news for you. When this world comes up against you, it doesn't matter how big the obstacle is, it doesn't matter how bad the pain is, there is good news in store for you, that you are more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. Can I get a witness if you know what I'm talking about? My faith is attached to Jesus. I'm drilled into the person of Jesus. I'm attached to this message, this good news, this gospel, that it's not about my strength and it's not about my accolades and it's not about my pedigree, but rather it is simply about my faith in the one. His name is Jesus Christ. It is not big, it is not large, it is small, but he declares to me all I need is something small to do something very big. Come on, somebody give him praise today. Now come on and give him praise. Come on, let's let faith erupt in this house today. This is what Jesus in Mark chapter four is telling a series of parables, and I don't have time to go through all of the parables, but he, he lands on this one. It's just two verses in Mark chapter four, verse 30 here, and he's talking about his kingdom. And he says, my kingdom is like a mustard seed which is the smallest of all seeds, but it becomes the largest of all garden plants. It's just this beautiful analogy that he's talking about what it is that I'm sharing with you today. And he's saying that if you want to establish my kingdom, that's why we're gathering today. Just hopefully that we know that we didn't just come in here just to simply consume something. We didn't just come here to spectate. We came in to participate in this thing called the church that has been going on for centuries. And until Jesus returns, I don't care how many more pandemics show up. I'm telling you what, the church of Jesus Christ, come on, even the gates of hell, they shall not prevail. It is built on a solid foundation and his name is Jesus. And we're gathering today and we're establishing his kingdom. I want to remind some people today that we're kingdom first people. It is great to be proud of your country. Just don't let yourself be found that you're more proud of your country than you are his kingdom. I, I, I'm proud to be a part of the kingdom. I am a citizen of another place. My faith is attached to Jesus. He says, my kingdom, it's like a mustard seed. He's talking about small faith, and I just want to, I want you to write these three things, I'm going to go quick here, 16 minutes, write these down, three things that small faith does, three things that small faith does. We're just going to walk through the text. Number one, small faith sees in the seed. It sees in the seed. This seed that Jesus is talking about, a mustard seed, if I had it in my hand right now, you probably wouldn't even be able to see it from where you're sitting. It's about one millimeter in size. It's like a speck. It's practically invisible. Yet just because I can't see something doesn't mean that I can't believe in it. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 says, now faith. Everyone say, now faith. Now faith faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. If I can see it, it might not be faith. If I can taste it, it might not be faith. If I can hear it, it might not be faith. Because faith, more often than not, is the absence of sense. You got some problems today that don't make sense? That's okay. You got a God that doesn't always make sense. And we begin to activate our faith. And just because I can't see it doesn't mean that I can't believe in it. And faith, small faith, the ability that it has is that it gets comfortable with invisible things. You say, but Rich, if you can't see it, there's no way you can believe it. Well, that's not true. Do you believe in the wind? Yeah. But you've never seen it. I know. But why do you believe in it? Because I felt it. Because I've experienced it. Come on, right here in Missouri, you all have experienced the power and the effects of wind. I have never seen God before, but at 37 years of age, the older I get, the more and more I am convinced that not only is he working, but he is active in the hearts of everyone, that if you will open yourself up to him today, although you can't see him, you can believe in him. And this shouldn't surprise us, right? Because there's all sorts of things that we can't see that we believe in. I had a small group at my house the other night. We call it Vu Crew. And uh, the way that we do our discussion guides at the crew is that we go to the internet and we download a PDF from one of the sermons on Sunday. I had a new couple in my house, first time in our house, and they were having a hard time logging on to the Wi-Fi. And they were trying They said, hey, can we get the password? And I shared my password, which I always think is funny because anyone like me, that like my Wi-Fi password is, is the, the code to my entire life. 
my Wi-Fi password is my bank account password. It's my son's inheritance password. It's like, here you go, here's my life, there you go. I gave it to you right there. So I shared my life with them and they, 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 they tried to log in, but after about seven minutes, I noticed that they couldn't, they couldn't, they couldn't log onto the internet. They couldn't connect. So we stopped the meeting, we said, are you okay? They said, we're just trying to, we're trying to get on to the internet. And they kept trying until they finally got connected. And I, it made me laugh because in all of my years of being around people when it comes to Wi-Fi, I have never met somebody yet who says, I give up on Wi-Fi. <laughs> why? I don't believe in it anymore. <laughs> well, why? Because I'm so burned out with Wi-Fi. Well, why? Because it took longer than I expected. But why? Because it disappointed me. Why? Because it didn't get me connected as fast as I wanted to. No, it's actually the opposite. <laughs> you ever sat next to somebody on the airplane who can't get their Wi-Fi? That's always a fun thing to watch somebody flip out about. I can't believe it, I'm 30,000 feet in the air and I still can't even get on the internet. It's like, bro, this is a miracle that you're gonna get on the internet right now. <laughs> you should be grateful, not complain, you know? But nonetheless, what you'll see is that somebody, they will keep trying and trying and trying and trying until they get connected. Can I encourage some people that faith is a whole lot like Wi-Fi? You can't see it, but it has the power to connect you to what it is that you need. Come on, somebody. Just because I can't see it doesn't mean that I'm gonna stop trying, that I'm gonna give up, that I'm gonna quit. No, I'm gonna keep on attempting. I'm gonna keep praying. I'm gonna keep believing. I'm gonna keep declaring because faith sees in the seed. But faith isn't just seeing the seed. Faith works in the dirt. Faith works in the dirt because if the seed has potential, how many of you know the seed's potential can only be realized once it's planted in the dirt? That scripture says in verse 32 that this small little tiny seed that's invisible practically, that once it's planted, it becomes the largest of all garden plants. That little phrase, yet when planted, is what sticks out to me. Because everything that I have, it is small in comparison to God. My gifts are small, my talents are small, my relationships are small, my influence is small, my bank account is small. Yet when I surrender it over to God, when I choose to plant it, when I release what I have into his hands. Our God declares, I can take that small thing and if you'll hand it over to me, I can turn it in to something big. If you believe it, put your hands together and thank God today that once you're planted, if the seed has potential, it means that the dirt has a purpose. I don't know what kind of dirt you walked in here with today. But I want to encourage you that all of the pain, all of the strife, all of the obstacles, all of the waiting, it has a purpose in your life. Church is funny, right? Because we say things that are super Christianese, you know, that only we know, you know. God is good. And all the time. Let go and you already know my sermon, yo. We say things like, you ever heard this in church before? Is he planted? <laughs> just before we start, I just wanna know, are you planted? We, we say these phrases and it's funny because I'm like from Miami, like we don't plant, like I, I, live in like, I lived in a high rise up until this past year, you know? Like I don't know anything about planting anything, but we still say this stuff in church. And it makes me wonder, if the seed could speak, what would the seed say it feels like to be planted? Because we sure talk about it a lot. We're sure asking the question a lot, are you planted? Are you planted? What does it feel like to be planted? Hey, Mr. Seed, what's it feel like? Does it feel good? I think the seed would be like, no, it doesn't feel good. <laughs> That's my seed voice. <laughs> no, no, it doesn't feel not good at all. <laughs> Mr. Seed, what's it like going underground? Mr. C, what's it like with all that darkness? What's it like with all that weight? What's it like with all of that dirt on top of you? Mr. C, does it feel good? Do you enjoy it? I gotta believe that the seed would respond back to you and I and say, it does not feel good. It is not comfortable. It is hard. It is lonely. It is scary at times, but I am a seed. Therefore, I remind myself, I am not buried by life, but rather I am planted. And if I'm planted, it is just a matter of time before something begins to grow, you gotta let the dirt do its work. Come on, somebody give God some praise. 
Let the dirt do the work. It has a purpose in your life. That seed can't grow without dirt on top of it. Yet when planted, what if all of the resistance and what if all of the pain and what if all of the obstacles and what if all of the challenges is not a sign that you're outside of God's will, what if it is a clear indication that you are right where you are supposed to be, that you are planted? I don't exactly know where it is that I'm going, but one thing I do know, I am staying planted. I have done everything I can to stand, but after you've done everything, stand firm and declare, my God will come through. It is just a matter of time. And as the worship team comes up here, the keys have got to come or I will just preach till tomorrow. Let, 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 let the dirt do the work. Let, let. That stuff is in your life. Not that you would run from it, but that you would, you would learn from it. Don't pray, God, take all the dirt away. Say, God, let me grow. Get me out of this, God. No, 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 God, what can I learn from this right now? Dirt's either helping you or it's hurting you. I was sitting with my, my counselor. I, I go to therapy, and you, you should too also. I, I really believe it. <laughs> we all need it. Praise God. And um, I was talking to my counselor, and she's just, you know, she's just so chill. You know, I'm not chill. She's just always, hey, how you doing, Reg? I'm like, not good. Why are you so chill? Get a coffee or something, you know? And um, I was just chatting with her. This is probably January. And I was just describing, you know, the pastor just told you it's 13 months. I'm not gathering with our church. I'm thankful for technology. I'm not like a hater. I'm so grateful that we've got technology that the message goes out. In fact, at VU right now, we're seeing more people reached with the messages from our local church. Something like 200,000 people are subscribed and watching our messages every, I mean, it's, it's an app, it, thank you God, no doubt about it. But at, at the soul of who I am is a local church pastor. And not seeing your local church for 13 months, it starts to take its toll on you. And I was just describing, I was just going, I just, I miss seeing people and I miss actually not just preaching to a camera lens, but looking in people's eyes. I miss seeing the stories of the impact of what this community means. And it's nice to get an email, but there's something different about seeing somebody on a Sunday. You know, it's nice to watch a fire on a television. It's a whole different thing to go and stand by a fire. And she said, well, Rich, you need to know something. You're an extrovert. I said, how much am I paying you? Uh, honestly, like, <laughs> when, yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> like, whoa, thank you. <laughs> no one's ever told me that. <laughs> and uh, she said, Rich, I just wonder, I just wonder if this is a season that if you'll lean into it right now, that God is refining you and that you've got a lot of things that feel like dirt, but Rich, what would happen if you would just let the dirt do its work? Rich, could it be that in this season, God is purifying your motivations and purifying your intentions once and for all? See, there is no doubt that there's power in the human spirit. Maybe you're new to church today and maybe you don't even believe in Jesus. You're so welcome in this house. We're so grateful you're here. And you should know that there is power in the human spirit. The human spirit has a will to live. And you can see stories all over the place of what the human spirit was able to accomplish. But she said, Rich, I wonder if this is a chance to purify your motives once and for all, that you are not simply operating out of affection and applause from the human spirit, but this is an opportunity for you to be motivated and for you to be fueled by the Holy Spirit. And something just stuck with me. I just said, yo, I'm gonna let the dirt do the work. I'm gonna let the dirt do the work. Cause I know the human spirit is powerful, but there is something, kind, nothing quite like the Holy Spirit. For when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you shall receive power. And I don't know about you, but I wanna walk out of this room today, not in the power of the human spirit. I wanna walk out of here today by empowered by the Holy Spirit, believing that we can see incredible things take place, not because of our great faith, but because of our small faith attached to a big, big God. Come on somebody. And give him praise. Give him praise.
Small faith sees in the seed, small faith works in the dirt, and lastly, small faith, it rejoices in the harvest. I just wanna remind you today, harvest, um, it's a season, it's not a destination. You don't live in the harvest, you go through the harvest. You don't go chasing a harvest, a harvest is a result. A planted seed, a polished watered seed, but only God makes it grow. Whatever he does, Psalms 1 says, it prospers. Prosperity is not something that you and I go and chase. Prosperity chases us. It's a result of planting. It's a result of tending and watering. And I just love what Jesus says here because Jesus says something that I just want you to catch. It's really, really beautiful. He says, yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants. A mustard seed, this little one millimeter seed, it grows to a 30 foot plant. This small, invisible thing becomes this large, massive thing. But then look at the detail that Jesus says. Jesus says that when it's planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants with such big branches that the birds of the air can perch in its shade. I don't think that the detail is random. I think that everything that Jesus says is by divine appointment. And he's giving you and I a picture of this little mustard seed that now it grows. And what does it grow? It grows into such a large plant that birds, random birds can come and find shade underneath this plant. Can I remind James River that God has not blessed you that you might simply be blessed, but God has blessed you that you might be a blessing to those around you. And as we look at all of the blessing, as we look at all the prosperity and all of the growth, and as we look at the campuses, and we look at the stories of people, we look at the buildings, we don't go, oh God, thank you for making us big and powerful, that we might just be big and powerful. No, we're reminded of Mark 4, that this little mustard seed that began invisible, that started some 30 years ago in the hearts of Pastor John and Debbie. I love this message because this is what they live. Let's see into the seed. Let's work in the dirt. We're not going to give up in the pain. We're going to rejoice in the harvest is coming. It's just a matter of time. We're going to rejoice. We're going to celebrate it. Here's the recap. Here's the story. But let's get back to seed. Let's get back to dirt. Let's rejoice. Back to seed. Back to dirt. It's slow, then it's fast. It's slow, then it's fast. But why has God grown you so large? I believe He has grown you so large that random birds birds that did not sow, birds that did not sacrifice, birds that did not serve, and birds that did not give. I'm telling you what, there are random birds all over this nation and all over this state and all over this city that they will walk into these doors, and when they walk in, they're going to discover the shade of this gospel. They're going to discover the shade of His mercy, the shade of His grace. And I want to let every person who's in here today, whether you've done one thing or not, you are welcome in this house. This place was built with you in mind that we've been blessed to be a blessing and we rejoice in the harvest and we celebrate that our God does big stuff with, with small stuff and when he blesses us we invite others to come and experience the blessing Hey everybody, thank you so much for joining James River Church on our YouTube channel. Our prayer is that you were encouraged and your faith was strengthened today. And we wanna let you know that we wanna connect with all our online family. You can just click the link next to me to connect to us. We'd love to meet you and connect with you. As well, we'd love if you subscribe to the channel and press the bell for notifications. I'll tell you what, it's a great thing to do because we're always putting out great sermons, new worship content, and that helps you stay up to date with everything that's happening. We hope you have a great day to day and we'd love for you to join us live for our services every Sunday and Wednesday. Thank you again for watching and God bless.